Good afternoon, everyone. Another uh, edition of our uh, studio virtual NAB. Um, we have our friends from uh, Sony today. We have Tom Covey and Paul Healy. And we, as you guessed, you know, we're going to talk about uh, digital cinema. Um, you know, their cameras, the uh, Sony Venice and the FX9 have sort of really mm -hmm. taken the, the business uh, industry by storm. Um, and I think we're going to talk about not only uh, sort of new features and, you know, and, and firmware updates that you guys have had, but also in general, the state of the industry regarding, um, you know, the uh, Sony presence in the cinema world. So I'm going to start with Paul. Um, Paul, you and I have known each other for a long time. And um, it seems like, you know, this is the first time, you know, we can't get in the same room together to talk about cinema. So, um, so in that regard, you know, I think, um, even though we're all in quarantine and I'm hoping that you guys are doing well, um, tell us a little bit, you know, what the, the, the past few years have been for the evolution of Venice in the world of digital cinema. Um, the acceptance is evident, you know, it, it really is, uh, it's a well-liked, not only well-liked, but I think it's, it's, uh, ubiquitous, you know, it's everywhere. Everywhere, everyone wants to use a Venice. So tell us a little bit from your perspective. Um, how have you seen the evolution of Venice in the marketplace? Absolutely. So we're um, at now to about two years since launching the camera. The camera launched in early 2000, uh, 20, 2018 it launched. And um, so since the launch of the camera, we've really had a tremendous amount of productions uh, using the Venice camera. I think really what we, what we struck upon uh, with this particular cinema camera, with the Venice camera, uh, was the fulfillment of digital cinema's convenience uh, with the aesthetics that everybody wanted from uh, from the technology. So we really found that crossroad between the two um, uh, creatives and the technology. Uh, the results, uh, just by means of uh, projects that everybody could see most recently, have been well over 200 known projects that um, have used the Venice. Uh, it crosses between broadcast, cable, streaming platforms and in the genres really uh we we have been in feature films we've been used for commercials uh we've identified that uh a number of series that have been uh, shot and we we actually dedicated a website to uh to share this information actually uh sonycine.com where we created this entire shot on list uh so naming all the projects would probably not be appropriate for this conversation but um there's, there's definitely a project of every genre that somebody could relate what our color science has really offered uh, cinematographers. really is what our um, foundation for the camera was. Let's give the best possible uh, imagery based on the color science. Let's give the sensitivity and the convenience uh, like things, uh, things like uh, ND filters uh, being built into the camera. So. Yeah, really, the camera has aided technology. The technology has aided the creatives, and uh, we're seeing the results of that by by a uh, groundswell of production. Now. Yeah, I mean, it seems like you know from the ground up, you know, when uh, the Venice was put together, you really actually listened to the community quite substantially to bring a set of, of, of features and tool set that the camera would really uh, sort of serve so many different. Uh, applications and purposes. Um, if you were to say, w when you go on on uh, demos or you talk to cinematographers or filmmakers and they speak to you about the Venice, um, what is the first thing that sort of come to mind on you know on their end that says this is this is the one reason why I love this camera so much? Right. So we have um, uh, uh, the film process obviously includes a lot of personnel, whether it be uh, the chief, the the cinematographer or the DIT uh, or even the camera assistants. And no one group could be ignored in what their top position, top reason for, uh, for using a camera would, uh, would take on. Um, so in the case of cinematographers, it continuously comes down to the ability to um, use dual ISO. So our Venice camera is capable of being uh, 15 stops of latitude, whether we're in ISO 500 or switching to our native ISO scalable, but native ISO 2500. And this has allowed um, a tremendous amount of uh, continuing shooting into dusk hour, tragic hour, as well as uh, representing 
various skin tones in a very um, pleasing way where, uh, where combined with our color science, it's actually having a nice roll off and a sensitivity that we could offer. Um, camera assistants might say they have a top reason. And for that, uh, it's, it's often said the ND filter uh, or the side panel, those are kind of equal. So in the ND filter world, they don't have to worry about dust or lens refraction or anything along those lines. And really, there's a constant call out on set of, hey, I just want to drop in this particular filtration so we could see what it looks like. Now this is done simply by a, a, a spin of a wheel, a press of a button. Um, and then on the DIT uh, side of it, they might say something along the lines of the 16-bit uh, raw signal. Uh, typically, what we're hearing is 16-bit uh, is really a holy grail for um, for raw acquisition and our ability to make media transfer uh, easier, faster, and a little more lightweight with using our XOCN uh, uh, recording has really aided that end of the department. So a little bit of a, um, a top tier for each one of them, uh, rather than just focusing on the chief of the image uh, uh, being the cinematographer. So, uh, given that you know, the camera already comes with uh, all these uh, features that are uh, become staples in in sort of uh, the industry, you've managed to uh, release version six. Uh, version six has a, a a slew of new features. Uh, some of them really, you know, I was surprised because they're extremely current, uh, and I'm sure you you know, you know which one I'm talking about. Um, but if you can give us like a, a an overview on um sort of what the mindset was behind you know version six you know and you know that official roadmap you know where it places the venice you know in, into the next cycle sure so our our firmware roadmap has been uh free of charge each time uh that we released a, a firmware uh as you mentioned we're, we'll be releasing version six and that's our big news uh, but certainly version five wasn't all that long though. It was just at the turn of year, so it was January. And at that time, uh, we had high frame rate capabilities released. We had um, the ability to do ProRes four by four and uh, a number of other features, but these were really enhancements that were uh, asked for by customers, maybe even as early as version one, they were asking for the enhancements. But these are features that um, uh, mostly did not need additional license or additional cost aside from optioning for high frame rate. Uh, one of the things that was opened up in version five so we could start expanding it in version six is, um, is really the um, ability to start using gyro sensor activity and, um, and, and additional lens data. So VFX, VFX teams could actually start to take advantage of the information that we could record to cards. Uh, so there's, there's several things in version six that really um, should excite the market. I mean, number one is the preset frame lines. Uh, to me, that one jumps out. We enhanced our frame lines uh, across several versions of our frame uh, firmwares, uh, most recently giving you uh, pixel accurate frame line indicators. And that's really for everybody that shoots charts, they would be able to shoot it with frame accuracy. Well, one of the big things for, um, for recent social media releases uh, would be the use of nine by 16 projects, uh, vertical projects, or perhaps one by one. And I think, I think we could all uh, say that we've watched some something on our cell phones recently or our tablets that allowed us to see this um, new perspective, right? So a nine by 16 vertical work is a great demand in not only um, scripted, but commercial work and social and all everything along those lines one by one, same thing. And to combine that with, we're actually going to be able to do second user frame lines at the same time as well. So I have a couple examples um, of those scenarios that, that could be shared on our website. But basically, the ability would be to take a uh, one by one 4032 by 4032 image, take advantage of the Venice's large sensor size while still being in a um, uh, different cutout. Uh, the other thing we're running into is there's not one delivery, one singular delivery of a uh, intended frame line. So you always see on set there's multiple frame lines, but usually it's 79, 69, it's something like that. What we're starting to see is actually 
the intent of a horizontal and a vertical delivery on the same mm -hmm. project. Yeah. So the frame lines are now going to be able to um, allow production on set to monitor as if they were delivering to both formats and, and obviously do the framing from there. So yeah. most camera assistants would say they live and die by their frame lines. Well, this isn't going to be their death. Yeah, but essentially um, the frame lines are, are great, uh, a great tool you know, for visualizing uh, the boundaries of your framing. But uh, by combining the ability uh, to have essentially two sets of extractions, you know, that allow the filmmakers, the cinematographers to say, okay, we are respecting the integrity of what we're creating because we have visually the ability to see both at the same time. Um, you know, and there's something that it seems like it's, you know, you put to the fore, you know, at Sony is, uh, the fact that you care about the creativity that people place into their project. So uh, more than the technology of adding a second set of frame lines was the, the ability to give people their creative freedom that they need to create, how they need to create with all these multiple deliver deliverables. Is that a motivation for you guys at Sony? Absolutely. When you think of creatives, um, I, I recently just uh, scanned some of my old uh, APSC photos, right? An APSC's concept was very, very similar. Basically, we're going to accept a larger uh, scale of a sensor or a film plane. And from that, we're going to do an extraction uh, for, for really what the focus of the moment is. And usually that's, that's not really usually for correction because uh, they usually have an intended frame. Uh, but the versatility in it to deliver something that is uh, designed in both ways was definitely a catalyst. And, this is in, in request from a bunch of different uh, production groups, really mostly the distribution end of it, but uh, end users have been stressed by this for a very long time. And uh, yeah, we're happy that we could bring it to them to, to simplify their creative intent. So two, two other mentions I think that um, are worthy uh, to talk about is uh, this new uh, transform uh, methodology you have, you know, uh, implemented in, in V6, and that's called the ART, uh, Advanced Rendering Transform. So uh, that's a new way of interpreting uh, lookup tables. Can you explain a little bit how that workflow, how that process is enabling uh, even more creativity in people using the Venice? Yeah, absolutely. So our advanced rendering transform uh, is a new file extension that we are going to load um, into the camera in order to deliver a more accurate representation of, um, of the luminance and the chrominance of the uh, image. So really what we're doing is in our, in a basically, um, in a, a grading suite, whether it be raw view or a different grading suite, you're still going to work with a 3D LUT and you're going to take that 3D LUT and put it into raw viewer to then create an art file. The benefit is that uh, if you see gradations or banding or anything like that in a uh, 33 cube that's a 3D LUT, it may uh, not give the representation on set that you really are getting an HDR signal that you're happy with. So now with the implementation of the art file, we're going to be able to insert it earlier in the video processing in our camera system. And not only that, but we could actually use uh, 65 cubes as well. So larger 65 cubes, the bigger the better, uh, yeah. will 100% be able to uh, bring a, the intent of what we are truly getting as a visual all the way through the process. So the concern might be, how do you monitor that? Or um, how do you actually grade for that? You are still working with the 3D LUT uh, afterwards in your grading process. The art file is really for, or the advanced rendering transform file is really for the camera's processing but it's based right on what you create with a 3D uh, LUT. Uh, same thing for onset monitoring. So monitoring is still just going to support uh, a REC 709 um, uh, or a 709 project uh, workflow. So it's not asking much of the production. It's really quite giving. The only difference is that um, it, it's, a, it's a file that would be created in Raw Viewer in order to, to support this. Now, we get a bunch of benefits as well um, with going over to the art files. We're actually going to be able to get um, uh, LUTed, essentially LUTed output to the viewfinder, which has been something everybody's been asking for for a while with the Venice camera. So we're now going to be able to 
uh, put an affected uh, or a looked file onto the viewfinder as well as the monitor. Um, there, there's a number of um, uh, 3D LUTs that have been reused over time as well. And that could be great if you're a cinematographer that wants to emulate something you did on a past project. But when you lose control over that LUT as well, you, uh, you see it turning up somewhere else perhaps. Uh, these art files are actually uh, planned to be secure and encrypted files as well. So we could actually protect them. But they're, in a nutshell, we still utilize the 3D LUT. Uh, we benefit from uh, a better transform on the onset monitoring. And we are further preparing uh, the production teams for onset HDR monitoring. So the art file really being a transform that allows uh, for a uh, proper monitoring of a definite look. And look is the transition word here. Uh, you guys have a new partner. Um, I believe it's Technicolor. Uh, tell us a little bit about you know, what, what's behind you know, that partnership and what it's going to give uh, Venice users. Yeah, so version six of uh, the Venice camera uh, will have a uh, very great benefit of our work with Te Technicolor. We've been collaborating with Technicolor and their award-winning uh, color scientists to create a look library uh, specifically for Venice. Um, as an overall, this resource will be a free of charge um, uh, uh, ability to a free of charge download for filmmakers. Uh, looking to use uh, Technicolor's experience in print emulation. Uh, so we all trust them. Uh, we, I think we know that uh, there's some rich history of where they developed looks for uh, early on uh, cinema cameras and uh, they became very much the standard. So what we'll be, uh, what we have already entered into with Technicolor is initially providing five looks that uh, are various forms of print emulation. Uh, they will be generally purposed to go to uh, a 709 target. That's that's the design for these um, for these LUTs. Um, we will be using the art file once again to uh, to work with them, and it will be exclusive to the version six uh, firmware. We will be tying it to that. And initially, again, with the with the lockdown period right now, with, with everything we're in, it's a little difficult to. Um, make a tremendous library, but we're gonna start out with um, five uh, files from the group and uh, from Technicolor. And we will be able to offer a very stylized image or perhaps something uh, a little more traditional to film print, but it's something that people have been asking for for a long time. Uh, we have been working and waiting for uh, uh, the best partner that we could uh, move forward with, and we're very happy to have uh, Technicolor's colors working with us on this. All this high-end uh, sort of wonderful world of features for the Venice, uh, how do we translate that and, and make some of these available for the little brother, the FX9, uh, Tom? So tell us a little bit about you know the, the success of the FX9 that not only comes from the fact that it is in some ways the little brother of, of the Venice, but it's really a camera in its own right, uh, you know, with a set of features that uh, are really sort of making it stand out, you know, in the marketplace. So tell us a little bit how you, you've you seen uh, the introduction of the FX9, and then we'll dive a little bit into some of the interesting new features that you've also released uh, recently. Sure, well, uh, I just remember going back to mid-September when the camera was introduced around IBC, and the excitement that was generated around it. I mean, it was it was really a heavily anticipated camera, and uh, it it did not disappoint. It's it's been an amazing camera. That first three four months that the camera was hitting the market, I was li literally living on the road, uh, and the excitement was around the fast hybrid autofocus, the dual base ISO, which we know we gained that experience from Venice as well as the color science experience in creating that new uh, S-Cinetone look that people are absolutely falling in love with. Uh, and then you combine that with all the amazing features that came over from the FS7 series, a camera that's been our one of our most success successful cameras ever. 
and you've got really the, the makings of, of a, an incredible camera that's only going to get better now with the release of the next firmware version. So um, the FX9, I think, has been used um, at least the way we've seen it with our customers um, in, in ways that are very hybrid. Uh, it's a terrific cinema camera, but it's also a wonderful news documentary, um, sort of non-scripted uh, type of camera. And I think um, you've all of a sudden, you know, with uh, this new firmware version, you opening it up, you know, to the world of raw capture. So tell us a little bit how that transition was uh, uh, in the making and, and uh, it's rolling out and who the partners are and if uh, the workflow is going to be very similar to what people have gotten used to with the FS7 series. Uh, sure. Uh, well, we are, of course, partnering up with uh, Atomos for our raw workflow. Uh, you do need, of course, a couple of things to have that be put into action. The firmware version 2.0 is going to have the feature set that provides the RAW. Uh, that's, of course, going to be able to go to uh, Atomos Recorder, which will be available around the same time frame the firmware will be. And then um, you'll be able to do things like 16-bit RAW in uh, the DCI 4K. Uh, you'll be able to do things like 10-bit RAW 4K, I believe it's 30, uh, the UHD at 10-bit uh, and 120 frames per second. So to be able to get that high resolution and continuous 120 frames per second is a pretty powerful thing. So you, um, you, you turn a lot of heads, you know, with um, the autofocus features of uh, the FX9. And, you know, you've managed to, uh, with 2.0, you've managed to bring some improvements to that. So tell us what, what these are. I mean, it's, you know, I think you've, there was one manufacturer and we know them. They're also our friends uh, who had sort of the lead and, you know, in autofocus for uh, uh, cinema cameras. Um, you guys have entered the market and you, and you really made a mark, you know, in, in, in that space. Um, tell us a little bit about how you, you've perceived what needed to be done for autofocus. Well, again, the amazing thing about the FX9 is the shared technology. We mentioned the Venice earlier, and then, our, of course, our Alpha series of cameras, our Alpha 7 series and 9s. They, and they have this amazing auto tracking feature, which combines, uh, it's a fast hybrid autofocus system. So phase detection, P-H-A-S-E, so it detects the distance of the object away, and you combine that with the contrast-based focus of traditional systems, and now you have fast and accurate system with a lot of parameters you can adjust. So things like, do I want to lock onto a subject or uh, switch to subjects quickly, or do I want to have these like smooth transitions to make it look more cinematic? So there's a lot of uh, control within that, including face detect. Now we add, we move in uh, version two to go all the way down to eye autofocus, which we've already been doing and quite successfully. Um, in my opinion that nobody does uh, eye autofocus better than Sony. And so this is really gonna be an incredible feature. I've had so many end users make comments that they never thought they would ever be a user of autofocus. And this is truly being a game changer. People are, finding ways or looking for ways to use autofocus, even a sit down interview, uh, moving back and forth in front of the camera. When you're shooting a full frame with a, a really fast lens wide open, you need to have that precise, fast, accurate autofocus. Now you're gonna get that with the eye autofocus and the new focus system. Yeah, I think it's it's been clear that people who um, never thought that autofocus would be a solution for them, you know, they're starting to think twice about whether, you know, it is something they can incorporate into their workflow. Well, that's a lot of features, you know, between the FX9 and the Venice, you know, that we don't have enough time to talk about everything. But uh, before we go, I'd love to give you the opportunity uh, to talk about what you may have wanted to show or you would have had on the floor in Vegas, which evidently is not happening. Uh, so here we are, you know, last few things that we'd like to mention, you know, that we're going to be important you know, for the audience to know about. Sure. Well, uh, 
Actually, two more things uh, that I think are really great new features with the FX9. One would be uh, still using the touchscreen interface, but now in a different way where we're integrating with that with the status menu. So now think of all those items that are in the, in the status menu. There's going to be a lot of items like um, changing your base ISO, changing your codex, or changing your image or scan mode with the use of the touchscreen through the status menu. Huge game uh, changer in terms of saving time. A lot of folks wanted to be able to change the, the frame mode with a uh, assignable button. Uh, we, we actually took it a step further with this ability to do it using the status menu because we could do so many more items. And then one other thing I uh, want to mention is regarding the output of the camera, which we have 12G, but in addition to the 12G, we now have 6G as well. So now you have support for 24 and 30 frame uh, time frame. So, uh, Paul, we live in different times. You know, I think you, you, you've mentioned, you know, in passing that there is a set of features that uh, Sony is taking a lot of importance to, you know, and it, it relates to streaming wireless technology. So, you know, last word to you. Yeah, so as Tom mentioned, our connectivity is always uh, uh, very important, whether on set or, or remote to set. Uh, most recently, what we've been able to do it with um, our camcorders is really um, have a cloud workflow that allows to either treat our cameras uh, like the Venice and the FX9 as a streaming device, or in some cases, be able to actually take out the proxy recordings from the camera remotely. So we still have the same amount of crew members uh, working, but they could work from a remote location. And this was really something that was already going to be shown at NAB as a product called the uh, XD Cam Air, and we're having a lot of conversations now for obvious reasons, but really unique environment where we could control the lens position, camera settings, restoration of the camera, uh, and various things all through um, a, a web browser. Uh, so we're, we're really excited by a solution like that, be able to already be prepared for what one step ahead of what people may have desired. Uh, so it's it's really unique that's starting to come together. And I'm sure we'll have an opportunity to talk more about XD Cam Air uh, for individuals, whether as a partner like yourself or uh, or just as our Sony website as well. But uh, yeah, that's one thing we're definitely excited with as well. Well, it's really, uh, really in sync with the times, right? Contactless, wireless, um, remote access. Uh, I think it's really... Uh, feature set that we're going to need to continue to live with for a while, uh, technology advancement, but also, you know, maybe for the greater good. So uh, that's all the time we have. So I want to thank Paul. I want to thank Tom for being with us today. Our friends at Sony, thanks again. Um, and for everyone else, uh, we have more sessions. So please tune in to our social media channels or our website. Uh, the NAB Express is also part of this initiative. So we hope to see you again. If you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Thank you.